be great. On. Now I'm going to mute everybody out. And I'm gonna... Oh, I see it. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to push the button to start streaming so everybody know that we're, we're going live. Pre transition. Start. Oh, make sure we're on the right one. Profile. BTA. Scene collection. BTA. Start the stream. We are live. Welcome, everybody, again and always to another Broadcast Team Alpha amazing show, podcast, whatever you want to call it, amazing offering. I'm Nori Love, and I am graced, as always, by my co host Augie Noss and Tom Schaefer, and we have a remarkable guest for you today. But before Augie tells you about our guest, I'd like to invite you to connect with us. You can connect with us on our YouTube channel, Broadcast Team Alpha, or on our website, BroadcastTeamAlpha.com. Uh, if you want to connect personally with us, just hit the contact button, and we will answer you back. Augie, Tom, how are you guys doing? Doing Wonderful. great. Yay. Augie, tell us about the amazing guest we have, please. Oh, yes. <laughs> we have a wonderful uh, treat for you today. Uh, we have a world traveler, a lecturer. He's an author, and he's a very frequent uh, radio guest. And uh, the gentleman's name is Stephen Myers. And uh, I want to just get right into it. I want to ask Stephen here, what in the world got you on this path when you would become so interested in pyramids? This is a subject that I don't think there's a single person on earth that is not interested in pyramids. Is that about right? Yes, everybody is interested in pyramids so uh, in one one form or another or one degree or another I uh, before I was interested in pyramids I used to be just like a regular guy and uh, <laughs> interested in technology I have a very technical background technical education that type of thing but uh, I, I like technology and also history you know a lot of people like history but when you combine the two you your focus will ultimately be directed towards the Great Pyramid because it's a highly technical structure, 45-story skyscraper, but it was built in ancient history. So uh, I became interested, and pretty soon it was a fascination, and then it became an obsession, you know, to understand how it was built and why. And then now it's my life quest. I have a nonprofit foundation that I have founded and written several books couple documentaries and that type of thing so it's uh it just it just grew from a from an interest to a to a passion and then you have traveled to egypt uh several times and uh dug dug up stones and found some really interesting stuff that uh, a lot of other people don't talk about so uh i'm gonna be all ears well certainly i've been to egypt and uh checked everything out and all of that, so it's a wonderful place to go. And if a person ever gets a chance, go to Egypt. You know, there's no place, no other place on earth like it. Mm -hmm. well, Stephen, uh, so tell us what is the uh, the main thrust of what you're doing. You uh, have a website called thepump.org. You talk about the building of the Great Pyramid as a series of locks and water raising up blocks. Maybe go into that a little bit and tell uh, those that aren't familiar with your work, let us know a little bit more about that. Well, what we're doing is we have a, a nonprofit foundation and it's dedicated to understanding how and why the Great Pyramid was built, but also to use the ancient high technologies that were available 
uh, back when the Great Pyramid was built to help our modern but very troubled world. And uh, one of those technologies is a very efficient water pumping system. And we think that the Great Pyramid was built using water locks and barges water locks from the Nile River all the way up to the building site. And we think the first stones that were set in place were the cake, the video oh, kind of went crazy. That's okay, just let's, we'll keep going because we are recording. I wonder what okay. happened. Okay. Was the casing stones the on the outside, the first layer of casing stones. And when those were set in place, it was like a square wall. Those stones are cemented together watertight and we think the original builders provided water to the construction site and fill that enclosure up like a square pond and stones on barges from the Nile River were able to come all the way up into that pond and uh, when the stones on the barges were moved off of the barges and down into the pond then the first layer of the Great Pyramid was completed. It was completed with ease no strong back muscles were required, no knuckle draggers, no thousands of workers. They used the efficient use of water, buoyancy, and water locks to build the Great Pyramid. On our website, we have a video series that describes the process uh, in detail. So that's fascinating. Yeah, uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. I find that fascinating. And um, so then all of the subsequent stones were like floated in, if you will, on barges? Yes, they were built level by level. So they would put the casing stones for the next level on next, and there would be a water lock that would connect to the, to the other water locks. And the, they would add additional water to fill the second level pond full of water. And then they could effortlessly bring the stones on barges up to the uh, second level and fill that pond up with interior stones and uh, complete the second level of the Great Pyramid. It's very visual and that's why we produced a documentary to uh, depict all of the processes involved in moving the stones and setting them in place. Mm -hmm. well, I saw that so like I did a quick scan I apologize for not being able to sit through all of them and really go through the analysis but I did watch the animations some of my curiosity, I know a lot of other people may be, and maybe you cover this in this, so it's my bad if I didn't hear this part, but uh, maybe go into the, some of the, you said you had some archeological findings that back up this concept of these, these water locks that literally move up the side of the, uh, the pyramid. Maybe talk about that a little bit, the archeological evidence. Oh, certainly. The Great Pyramid isn't like it was when it was, first finished. It has been uh, decimated through at least 40 centuries of uh, destruction. The casing stones that were on the outside that incorporated water locks, we think, are gone. So there's no water locks that are operating at the Great Pyramid. But also, uh, you know, Egyptologists talk about a big mega ramp, but there's no big mega ramp there. So we, we, have, a, we have a puzzle with a lot of pieces that are missing. But there is a lot of evidence that indicates water was associated with the Giza Plateau as well as uh, the Great Pyramid. There's a, there's a harbor very close to the base of the Great Pyramid. Uh, you can word search Giza and harbor and find a wealth of information. Herodotus described the Great Pyramid as being like an island surrounded by water. So uh, at, uh, up until the 17th century, there what used to be a wall around the Great Pyramid. We think during the construction process, that wall um, impounded water, and we, we depict that in our video series. Uh, Sir Flanders Petrie found Nile Earth inside the Great Pyramid, which is sediment. So there's a lot of different types of evidence that uh, is associated with the Great Pyramid in terms of water and uh, the uh, construction process, the casing stones are cemented together watertight, which I find very interesting. Uh, they're not cemented together to keep the Pharaoh's soul from leaking out of the building. <laughs> and they're not, they're not cemented together for, uh, to keep all that Egyptian rain out. 
Because well, there are other people that have actually talked about water being closer than it is right now. It's a, it's a couple miles away now. But yes. I think that uh, people have done some reverse studies that showed that actually that is true, that there was water much closer to the pyramids than, it, than there is now. Yes, the Nile River has changed course over the millennia, and uh, it, other people contend that it was uh, closer to uh, the Great Pyramid than it is right now. But anyway, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of ideas about uh, the direct physical evidence and, and how it can be interpreted. So uh, we think that that... Uh, well, what do you say about people that have, have actually come up with other theories that talk about the pyramids being a power station, that it's a giant power generator? Then uh, there's some other texts that talk about the pyramids being a place for uh, what they call the, uh, the supplicant or the person who is trying to go to the next level in their spiritual development. And mm -hmm. there was a, con a convergence of, of multiple pyramids within pyramids and that those, some of those points inside the pyramid were meant to help focus that energy. Is that all still part of what you, you understand? Uh, there's the, the great pyramid is evidence and people have interpretations of evidence like, uh, you, let's say you have something wrong with you. You go to the doctor. What the doctor provides for you is an opinion. And, and the doctor gives you uh, the advice to, if you don't like what he says, to get another opinion. And all of these uh, researchers, myself included, are kind of like doctors and providing an opinion for the, for the evidence. But what my opinion is, is that uh, the Great Pyramid helped people. It helped people in a tangible way, not spiritually and not, um, you know, uh, religiously and not in terms of a funeral, but it helped people by being infrastructure, just like our civilization builds great big hydroelectric dams. And we don't do that for people to become initiated or uh, go, go to a higher level or whatever. But what our hydroelectric dams do is uh, after a huge investment, they provide prosperity. And we think that the Great Pyramid, instead of just being built for people to have a religious experience, actually helped the civilization that, uh, that built it. Not us, they, were, they didn't build the Great Pyramid to tell us that they knew pie or anything like that, but they <clears> built it so the, so the civilization that built it, their kids, could have a full belly. And that's what we think the Great Pyramid was for. It provided a huge return on investment. Just like in Washington State on the Columbia River, they built the largest structure in North America. And when built, the most expensive, it was the Grand Coulee Dam. And what it does is irrigate a half a million acres of farmland. Most of us have ate apples that have been irrigated by this huge construction project. And that's so what, what do you think the what do you think the direct benefit then was as an infrastructure piece? What was that direct benefit then? Oh, the purpose of the Great Pyramid, yes, the return on investment. The huge cost needs to provide an, a return on investment that is greater than the cost, just like anything, you know, a pencil or a, a car or whatever. But uh, it certainly provided uh, water for irrigation. It also uh, powered a machinery probably that did a whole host of things include generate electricity it uh, used the uh, the water to make compressed air for a whole host of industrial and scientific purposes I see the Giza plateau as more of a science center an industrial park than a graveyard for uh, important important people so that's that's what it was it did it did all those things. You know, uh, let's say a hydroelectric dam, all it does is make electrons go through wires. But we, we uh, power our civilization with it. And that's, that's what, uh, you know, that's what makes us in the first world different than people in uh, other, you know, first, third world countries, is that we have infrastructure. And that's, that's what the Great Pyramid did. It, it, it was an, a huge investment, but a huge return uh, return on investment. Now you asked, you mentioned in your, your video series that this water kept, they kept bringing water up. How did they get the water to the top level? Was it, how was that pumped up there? Do you know? 
I do know. I'm glad that you asked me. <laughs> That's what I do is know. Uh, during the early stages of construction, they uh, are building the Great Pyramid, which is on solid bedrock. They excavated down below the Great Pyramid construction site. This is before it was built and created a room about 100 feet below the Great Pyramid. That room and associated cuttings acted like a water pump. It pumped water to supply the water for the water locks to build the Great Pyramid. So uh, it was like a, in modern times, the, verse, the first thing they do at a construction site is bring in those big, tall, spindly cranes. And modern people lift from above to assemble uh, tall structures. But ancient man in the Great Pyramid uh, pushed up from below using the buoyancy of water. So the subterranean chamber acted like a water pump to supply water for the water locks to build the Great Pyramid with ease. Okay, so it just takes me even further. Okay, so you got water down below in a large room. How, how is it getting up? Is it basic physics that they used, or what was the? Was there we think that it's mechanism? similar to a hydraulic ram water pump. Water went down the subterranean chamber, down into that chamber through the descending passage, about 300 feet long, to the uh, subterranean chamber, which is about 100 feet below the base, and then uh, ultimately water went up through the grotto and up through the mound. The Great Pyramid is built on a mound. And then uh, the, uh, those ponds that I talked about earlier, those construction ponds, uh, were kept full. So the, uh, below the Great Pyramid, we think, was a water pump. And then the Great Pyramid itself was uh, an additional water pump. They, they operated a little bit differently, but they were built to operate um, in series. And then it made it a much more powerful and robust system that they used uh, in their civilization you know the thing is that uh, there's some evidence to this water pump actually because there's a guy in illinois he, is, he was a contractor his name was onan and he built a pyramid uh, to live in and uh, he uh, said that after he got the pyramid all put together they still had to put the floor inside but he had a problem because the water, which they were pretty much dry ground up to that point, but now he had water coming up inside the pyramid and he had to drain it off somewhere. So he had to figure out that, well, he was building a moat around the pyramid because he had to funnel that water somewhere because it just kept coming out of the ground. Yes. Yeah, Same there's thing, certainly maybe. an association between water and, and pyramids. Uh, and and that, that's fascinating. That's north of Chicago here in the United States. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite a place. I haven't been there yet, but it's on my bucket list. Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, he also layered the outside of it with a very thin layer of gold. He did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. What do, you, what do you think that purpose was? Well, uh, I think that purpose for that particular structure was decorative myself. So uh, it was a large yeah. gold uh, plated, if you will, a pyramid and it's a beautiful structure. It recently uh, suffered from a fire uh, about four or five months ago. So it's uh, been repaired, but it's a beautiful building. There's also some large statuary around that, uh, mm -hmm. that building. So uh, yeah. Um, it's it's very interesting to think about about that especially uh the great pyramid being able to help people in a tangible way yeah i think there may be more to this pyramid also because i know um onan in chicago he said that when he had relatives that came there in fact some of the relatives wrote about this they came there with a the flu or they had some other uh, viral problems or maybe they were sick and they didn't spend very much time in the building and all these things just just went away. And uh, when years and years ago, I was still, oh God, uh, probably about 
18, 19, 20, 21, something like that. I was experimenting with a little pyramid that I made. And I put razor blades in it because I heard the rumor that if you put a razor blade in the position inside a pyramid where the uh, king's chamber is, which is about you know three quarters way up uh, or a third way up, <laughs> you can sharpen them. And that actually worked. They, those razor blades became sharper by, well, it took a while. I think maybe a month or more or two or three. I, I forget how long it was, but it became sharper. That's interesting. There is a lot of anecdotal evidence for uh, mummying cats and uh, keeping fruit from rotting and sharpening razor blades uh, with pyramids. And that's something that uh, people that are interested in pyramids themselves uh, can look into. But for uh, the specific structure of the Great Pyramid, I would think it would be easier to sharpen their own razor blades than to build this yeah. big structure. So we're talking about what makes sense or return on investment. Like we can build a big structure that would symbolically tell people 10,000 years from now that we knew pi, but I don't think we'd spend $15 billion to make such a building. So if you got, you got to look at it as like, does it make sense or is there a return on investment? Like alien, let's say aliens came to earth, but they needed to build a great pyramid as a beacon. Well, if they can make it all the way to earth, then they probably wouldn't need a beacon to find their way around earth to pile up rocks. So you just gotta, you know, people just have to look at my research as well as everyone else's with, with an open mind. So that's, that's all that I, that I ask from people. Mm -hmm. So, Stephen, you, you, um, your theory, it's very pragmatic, you know, very logical, um, but it, it blows out of the water, if you will, a lot of the beliefs that people have about uh, ETs and Pleiadians and mm -hmm. um, it being a time of greater knowledge, you know, because it sounds like where the way that I'm perceiving this is that we're comparing it, you know, return on investment now, like return on investment then. Were they really thinking return on investment then if it was such an enlightened or spiritual age? Or are you oh, just yes. poo-pooing oh, it? Oh, yeah. Anyway? See, us in the first world, we're inundated with uh, prosperity, if you will. You know, we you go down to the store and I mean, we're going to eat. I'm going to eat. My wife's going to eat. Everyone's going to eat tomorrow. But uh, in a lot of civilizations, even today, in times, that wasn't guaranteed. But they built the Great Pyramid, and instead of using back muscles to, to do things, they could use the water power to do things. Yes, it's a universal uh, truth that people now or in the past uh, need some sort of prosperity. And I think that... Um, wise people both in the in uh the future or both now well in the future but in the past a wise leader said how can i help my civilization okay we're talking about a leader in the past how can i help my civilization well let's build this big hydroelectric dam and then we'll have electricity the uh grand coulee dam used electricity to make aluminum and it was instrumental in helping us in the war effort in World War II. So uh, I think prosperity is a universal concept for people. And I mm -hmm. think that the ancient builders were geniuses and uh, made a high civilization with their prosper with uh, prosperity with this infrastructure. In civilizations, infrastructure generally comes first, and then the high civilization is the result of that infrastructure. So I, what I think is the original builders were geniuses and where the technology came from is beyond the scope of my research. I wanna know what was done to build the Great Pyramid, not where that technology came from. It might've been from uh, aliens or whatever, but it also, there may, uh, there may have been a few geniuses like a Nikola Tesla way yeah. back 
when the Great Pyramid was built, or another guy like Victor Schrauberger or other geniuses that uh, were able to, um, you know, design and build this structure that uh, that was able to help people. That's that's what I think. I think the pyramid structure buildings and houses and stuff has become very popular, well, in the last 30, 40, 50 years, maybe. And uh, I'm going to do a little trick here. I'm going to teleport myself right over to a place right here in Arizona where they actually have a building like that. Oh, but this one is in Arizona. <laughs> and it's uh, basically a, a two-story uh, building. They got the bedroom upstairs and then uh, in downstairs. Uh, I've seen a picture of it inside and looks really nice inside. These buildings, they outside of, uh, I think it is outside of Oklahoma City, also uh, in Oklahoma, they got a whole little village of pyramids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these places, they seem to have some of the same stories that it's good for health. So, uh, I've heard that. yes, pyramid power, well, and uh, there, that's a possibility. Well, I have yeah. to tell the truth. I mean, I, I had a pyramid. I had pyramid over my bed. I had a pyramid. I was a hairdresser right, 150 years ago, 200 years ago. And I had, I always, I mean, I would buy really great cutting shears, you know, like $200 pair of, of scissors. And I would always put them underneath a glass pyramid that was like this, the, the correct um, uh, measurements. And I, you know, what do I know? I thought that they stayed more sharp um, comparatively to my co my coworkers. They seem to be sharper, longer, but um, so I don't know. But there's a lot of people in the chat room. Um, uh, Harry is there and P.T. Huber is there and um, they're talking about the, um, that there's a spaceship underneath the Sphinx and uh, talking about more of the, um, the ET know, connection, ex the extraterrestrial, yeah, yeah, um, aspect of it. Sure, sure, it'd be nice to have a picture of a spaceship underneath the Sphinx, but uh, <laughs> that's not available. So, yeah, I don't know. You know, the Sphinx uh -huh. is uh, right there by the Great Pyramid, you know, not for 100 yards, but uh, the Sphinx is not the focus of my research, although there is water erosion associated with the Sphinx and its enclosure. So certainly water was on the Giza Plateau. Uh, Christopher Dunn, another researcher who wrote the Giza Power Plant, contends the original builders were able to deliver water to the Great Pyramid. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, but as far as ETs or anything like that, uh, that's, that's where the technology came from or who built it. Uh -huh. And the focus of my research is how it was built and why. So who who, who built it is uh, something that uh, people can conjecture over, but I don't know if it'll ever get anywhere. Right. Yeah, I see. That, and what kind of material is the stone? What kind of stone? Uh, the Great Pyramid is primarily limestone. It's built on a limestone solid bedrock and on a mound. And the casing stones are exceptional high quality uh, limestone that was uh, quarried across the river. So all researchers, Egyptologists acknowledge that the builders put these stones on barges and move them across the river. But I just think that they continued the process and made it much easier by moving the stones on barges all the way up to the building site. And then there is some granite that uh, in the King's Chamber and other chambers so, uh, but mostly, uh, mostly limestone. The interior stones that you see now are a rough cut, uh, poor quality limestone because the casing stones have been removed. But it's, uh, it's made of stone. Other pyramids, like in South America, are, are made of like uh, rubble, if you will, uh, dirt. Or, so there's a, there's a whole different uh, distinction between various pyramids. They're not all built using the same process or built uh, with the same design or even have the same purpose. So we're just talking primarily about the purpose of the Great Pyramid. Yeah, and then we look at the surface of the, let's take the Cheops for a change. And uh, look at the Cheops, you know, you can see the stones, but the 
the originally they talk about to be very slick surface on it. So uh, what I'm hearing is that um, the uh, Egyptians in uh, the area, they took the stones from the building and from the Cheops pyramid to make their own homes with. And uh, they cut them up partially and uh, they used them to build basically Cairo. Yes, around 1000 AD, there was a pretty big earthquake in the area and it loosened the stones on the uh, Great Pyramid, the casing stones, but also destroyed much of Cairo. So they just used the Great Pyramid as a quarry, and took the stones to uh, rework for their own uh, rebuilding of Cairo. So that's uh, what happened to the uh, casing stones. The few that remain are still bonded together watertight. I find that interesting piece of evidence. Mm -hmm. Stephen, a uh, question for you. So in your research, in summary, has this foundation that you've built with this particular theory, has it answered other questions that have been outlined that were maybe a part of the research or not part of the research, and then all of a sudden other things dropped into place because of what, what you've come up with? Well, you primarily, other discoveries. primarily, again, we're focusing on uh, how the Great Pyramid operated as a unique water pump design and, and how to redevelop that for modern times. But uh, certainly uh, there's a lot of researchers that are following this direction. The Great Pyramid was built and people want to know how that was done. And I read a book about skyscrapers. It talked about how the skyscraper was built and what it was used for. Read a book about aircraft carriers. It talks about how the aircraft carrier was built and how it was used. So that's uh, the, the twin focuses of my research. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, the, but there's other researchers, you know, about the harbor that's recently been found right on the Giza Plateau. And then uh, other, other things, other researchers are contending that uh, the, the, the use of these barges, there was a recent barge that was found that was very similar to what Herodotus described uh, in his uh, book the histories and it had a kind of an unusual design but they found a, a barge uh, that was uh, submerged so so yeah a lot of this stuff ties in to other things but mainly it just uh, what I'm trying to do is acknowledge that the that ancient humans weren't knuckle draggers or that we evolved from worms or or slugs or anything but that ancient human beings our ancestors our distant relatives were geniuses and understood properties of the of uh, physics that maybe we don't understand and need to to help us in our modern world. It's a case of taking our 21st century mentality and shifting gears and saying, okay, how would you move a large stone? Like uh, I know that uh, in uh, uh, the was it Rapa Nui where the uh, the Moai those large statues. There was a lot of theories about how those statues were moved into place and, and nobody really came up with anything until they actually tried to move one and they said, okay, let's just try to move one. What can you do? And then they found out they could literally rock them and make them walk. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that we just don't think of that they use nature and a lot of natural forces, try to distort the word a little bit, they use natural forces to... Uh, to do these things and I think it's not maybe not apparently obvious but then as you start to think it through some of these things shine through yes the uh, some uh, the the original builders of the Great Pyramid I think were quite elegant and sophisticated in their uh, construction process I know that water locks people say oh that's not fancy enough or whatever but water locks are the system of choice in the 21st century to move our heaviest objects. Real people that really have to accomplish goals, that's not Egyptologists, but real people expanded the uh, uh, Panama Canal with larger water locks because that's the system of choice to move our hugest objects that we move. Well, I think that the similar technology was used in ancient times. Where so, I grew up in, uh, uh, across the river from St. Louis is uh, Lock 27, which is a series of locks for moving sh uh, big barges. 
yes. through a very dangerous part of the river. They bypass that part of the river and they go through these locks. And uh, I've, I was went there as a kid. We had a field trip and went there and saw it in action. So I've actually seen them up close. Yeah, people think that water locks are slow or cumbersome, but in the 1830s, when the Erie Canal was built, the canal was four and a half feet deep, and the barges carried payloads of 70 tons, which is the weight of the largest stones of the Great Pyramid. So it's, it's fascinating to consider this construction process, but also that the purpose of the Great Pyramid had uh, a, a high return on investment, if, if I can say that, you know, that the geniuses come up with and, uh, you know, and, and they had prosperity. It's uh, Okay, think this is a part where I'm kind of, I'm, I, I like you saying this, but I need a little more detail. When you say okay. this thing actually helped them, okay, so you've got all this water and it's going up in the pyramid and it's ultimately coming down through the center core, through that center, uh, and it, then it's going back out. And you're saying this whole process was like a giant pump for irrigation and for water, for infrastructure use throughout the, uh, the kingdom or throughout the, the country. Yes. What we think was water was, was supplied to the uh, Great Pyramid. Other researchers think that was uh, that the original builders did that. And that water went down the subterranean chamber and then up through the uh, Grand Gallery and the Queen's Chamber. And then ultimately it exited out the King's Chamber vents. We also contend that there was some passages that were in the casing stones about about eight inches square similar to the vents that went down from this great height or in other words the pump had a pretty good head if you will see my hands they, they, they pumped the water up high and then it went down through the casing stones and then ultimately to the point of use right around the Giza, the Giza plateau right next to the Great Pyramid are some large excavations and we think there could have been a hydraulic uh, air compressor, if you will. And I discuss all this in my book, but uh, power heavy machinery right close by and also um, irrigation and, and a host of other purposes, you know, for electroplating, for uh, experimental purposes with compressed air. You can make uh, ice, believe it or not, with a Venturi tube. It's a tube that has no moving parts but the, the air goes through it and one side is extremely hot and the other side gets extremely cold. Those could be used for medical purposes, for uh, everything from tempering steel. So that, so it was uh, just a, a um, not a religious center, but an industrial park. So uh, that's, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, uh, it, it's an amazing thing to think about all the uh, you know, all we have left is just the bare bones of the Great Pyramid and a few artifacts. But to imagine the high culture and high civilization of their uh, all of their abilities. Well, once yeah. you've got water, then you've got farming, then you've got civilization. You got people being fed, and it builds the the basis for that economy. I guess um, you've got a couple of books out. Oh, that we've basically been talking about. The, the technology, you've got two of them. One is the lost technologies of the Great Pyramid, and the other one is the prosperity machine. Yes. We really haven't talked on that yet, but what is the prosperity machine about? Well, the Great Pyramid, we think, was built to provide prosperity. And what that specific book is about is how water actually moved through the Great Pyramid, you know, from various passages and chambers. And there are a number of missing parts and pieces in the Great Pyramid, between the Grand Gallery and the King's Chamber is the antechamber, and it has some slots that have no stones in it. We think that those uh, stones were a type of a check valve, and there were some other parts and pieces that made the, made the thing operate. We have a DVD documentary that also depicts the Great Pyramid operating uh, like a water pump that's called the Great Pyramid Water Pump, available from Amazon. So they, uh, there's a lot of information. We have the nonprofit. We've uh, conducted a lot of research. That research has been available in two books and two DVDs, uh, documentaries. So I hope people will become familiar with the research 
and uh, just to uh, we're not trying to blow anybody else out of the water, but we are offering a, a whole unique opinion as to the purpose of the Great Pyramid and for people to become familiar with it and other researchers and decide which one makes the most sense. I wonder though, there, uh, it's not just the Cheops, there's three other, uh, two other pyramids and then the little piddly ones, which really doesn't amount to anything. But what about the other two there? Are they uh, maybe the same purpose or do you think that was different? I think that they're entirely different. There's no real feature specific to the Great Pyramid that indicates there's, that the original builders of the Great Pyramid intended any relationship between it and the other pyramids. Yeah. In other words, those other pyramids could have been built thousands of years after the Great Pyramid, you know, a whole different civilization. So, so who, who knows? People say, well, doesn't the pyramid next to the Great Pyramid have to be a water pump? No. We think that if there is some sort of a relationship, that the pumped water from the Great Pyramid could have been used to build the pyramid next to it. But um, other people think that those other pyramids were built for some purpose we don't know, or even as like a cargo cult. And I don't know if you are familiar with cargo cults, but societies that become exposed to high technology will often worship the people that that come up with that high technology uh, in the during World War II in the islands in the Southwest Pacific, that was a common occurrence. People would uh, see all the stuff that people would bring those soldiers, you know, Japanese or American soldiers, and worship those people and worship their cargo for prosperity. So they would uh, uh, have a cargo cult and make make airplanes out of palm branches to appease the gods and maybe they would come back and bring all of the spam or the canned beans or the radios or whatever. And uh, we think that the, the possibility is that the other pyramids were some sort of a, a cargo cult that built them. You know, like if one, if one pharaoh or king says, well, that, that pyramid's mine, well, the next pharaoh, he's got to make a pyramid so he can be a big shot too. So, so it's hard to say what the other pyramids did or were for, or even if they were from the same civilization. So much more research needs to be conducted. I think that's probably a lot later because I think Khufu, which they think built Cheops, uh, I think he, uh, he lied about it. He just claimed it. I because think that's true. That's true. That's the way politics are from the yeah. beginning of time you know if the economy is good the president says see what i did yep you know and uh if i was a king in an agrarian society and there was this pyramid you know down down the road i'd say yeah i'm responsible for that pyramid and you know it, it's just the nat the human nature for people to do that so yeah so and I the ops probably uh took credit for it or claimed it, but I think it was built much earlier. I really do. I think there's actually some evidence to that too, because if you look at the, the uh, Sphinx there, the water erosion on the Sphinx, that comes from water. And there is at least 15,000 years back in history before you can have rain enough in that part of the world to create that erosion. Right, that would be uh, pre-Ice Age. And yes. uh, so that certainly changes the uh, idea of the date of the Sphinx. So if there's any association with the same culture that built the Sphinx as the Great Pyramid or other pyramids, that would put them way farther back in time yep. as well. So everything, everything about the Great Pyramid is under scholarly debate except its location. Yeah, yeah. And then again, of course, we have pyramids in other parts of the world. In fact, in China, there is one made out of iron. And it is huge. Not quite as huge as the Cheops, but it's still huge. It's just made out of iron. It's sitting there in the wilderness in northwest China. And the Chinese don't even want to talk about that because it, they can't explain it. And then we have in the Midwest, there is smaller pyramids in South mm -hmm. America and other places. In fact, uh, I'm going to teleport myself again. I'm going to teleport myself right to the moon. 
there I again. Oh wow. my goodness. You, how, how, fast. how have you become so technologically adept, Augie? Wow. Um, been holding, he's been holding out on us. Wow. <laughs> Look at that one. That is a NASA print from the moon, and it shows a pyramid. Oh, I see it. Yeah, right. What you're pointing at. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, nice. Certainly, we need more uh, research about pyramids on the moon or Mars or even uh, China. You know, I'm, I'm always an advocate of, of uh, knowing more about yeah. these things and, and transcending all the misinformation. So uh, let's, uh, let's go to the moon and look at that pyramid and find out about it. I'm, I'm in favor of that. That's Boy, better that be interesting. military. Yeah, and uh, I want to come back to the studio here. So here I am. Oh, I'm glad you're back. <laughs> wow. Welcome back, Augie. <laughs> oh, thank you. Bring any uh, moon dust with you? Mm -hmm. No, gosh, I forgot. No, oh, next time. Maybe next time. <laughs> well, great. So tell us, tell us about your books. And you have, uh, what do you, you have a video series, right? You I have a video series on our website that people yeah. can look at for free, certainly. Uh, because we're a nonprofit, but I do I do have two books. The first book is specifically about how the Great Pyramid was assembled, how stones were moved and set on top of each other. Some people aren't interested in that, but uh, I think that it's uh, very interesting how this ancient structure was built. And that's my first book. And then my second book, the Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine, is about why it was built, how how the water goes through the the passages and chambers and how the water was used and all of that. So that's two, two books. It's kind of a natural division in the research. And then we have the two documentaries, uh, Building the Great Pyramid with Water Locks and Barges is the first one. And uh, it's about how the Great Pyramid was assembled. The second one is about called the Great Pyramid Water Pump, and uh, that's what it's about. A lot of computer-generated animations in both of those. All of those are available from Amazon, and the books are available in soft cover or Kindle ebook format. So if you're uh, into the ebooks, which a lot of people are, I'm finding out, mm -hmm. then you can uh, get those books right away. So, yeah. so it's a lot, a lot of information, and I hope people uh, look into the information and find out uh, what it's all about. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So when I when I looked at your website and I saw so, so the locks are the like canals, is that correct, if you will? Okay. Yes, they are. They're canals with doors on each end that uh, connect to another one that's at a different height. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, just like the Panama Canal or whatever, you can, you can lift heavy payloads or in uh, fact, they're kind of like an anti-gravity machine, you could call them if you want to and move uh, and lift heavy payloads. So we, we think that's how it was done. And we also think they use specialized barges that uh, where it's able to manipulate the stones to help set them in place. So it's uh, quite a sophisticated process to uh, build the structure. Much more sophisticated than people with strong back muscles dragging stones up a ramp that's bigger than the Great Pyramid and then not uh, causing any handling scars on these precision cut stones. That's what Egyptologists say. Right, and then there's some people who say it was built from the top down. Some, some do, you know, in various, uh, various ideas. In fact, Herodotus was told that the Great Pyramid was built from the bottom up, but finished from the top down. And we think that when the Great Pyramid was completed, then uh, the water locks were removed from the top down along that flight of water locks. And that maybe is the, the kernel of truth that this, um, that, that idea that Herodotus was told back in the fifth century BC. So, so it's interesting. Herodotus was also told that uh, they used machines that incorporated short wooden planks. So a lot of people interpret that as saying, oh, well, they're levers, but nobody really uses short wooden planks to lever a 70-ton payload effectively. But water locks use short wooden planks in their doors. So 
So it's, it's just interesting to, to consider all of these little bits of information. It is interesting. It's very interesting. There was something very, something very captivating about the whole, you know, schematic, the, the drawing of it and um, something very romantic. And I don't know, it, it, it's an interesting perspective, right? And I'm just looking at it from that point of view. But there was something about it that made me go, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that look into it, they get a hold of me either by email or whatever, but they, they use the word compelling. There's a, just a compelling aspect of it that real people really did move those stones and, and that might be the method that they actually did it. And, and it's interesting. Now, people that work in shipyards or people that are like truck drivers and technical people really really like the direction of my research but people like egyptologists archaeologists nothing yes. they, they, uh, all they want to do is everything has a religious purpose or they moved everything with big back muscles so well i think it's fascinating and i appreciate your work thank you well thank you for that i uh, i needed that that got me through the day <laughs> oh absolutely yeah guys you have any so what's next, Stephen? What's the next step for you in this kind of research? Where are you going? What's the next big thing then? Well, we, uh, I'm just a humble researcher out here in southwestern Oregon and, uh, you know, associated with some other people in our uh, nonprofit foundation. But we're doing a lot of things, a lot of irons in the fire, uh, possibly another trip to Egypt for ongoing research. That would be our uh, kind of a expedition back to Egypt. Also, uh, we're do doing some YouTube videos as opposed to a whole series or uh, documentary just to, on various aspects associated with the research. People can go to our YouTube channel and see those. Uh, doing research here, we have a uh, facility, believe it or not, uh, like a workshop, or whatever you want to call it, a laboratory that uh, we are uh, making uh, you know, components and sub-assemblies uh, that part of our research is the most expensive for uh, custom fabrication in a fairly large scale. So we're doing that. And we also have a fundraising effort for a 3D printer. We're about halfway there. You can go to our website. It's uh, through uh, crowdfunding, uh, GoFundMe. You can look, uh, word search it through there, you know, Pharaoh's Pump, and you'll get to it. So we're doing all of those things. You know, it's a... Uh, Research is just like a little little step, you know, at a time. But uh, we're so making got the, the pump.org. We, we've got your website, the pump.org, up on the screen. So if they go to that site, they're going to be able to get to these other links to the GoFundMe and to the various the GoFundMe, other sites. Yeah, and also the uh, uh, YouTube videos and other stuff. But they can contact us and find out what we're about. They can, uh, you know, get involved, you know, instead of just arguing with people on Facebook or watching sports, you know, get involved and do something in your life. Yeah. You know, uh, you know what I'm trying to say? Absolutely. So many people, oh, my team won. Good. Did you help anybody? You know, get involved. Ask us what we're doing. Say, hey, can I help somehow? You know, can I help with your website? Can I uh, donate some materials? You know, if they live close by, they can come by and help with welding. You know, anything. You know, they can give us an idea. They can there's a lot of authors that have donated their books for our research library. So, uh, you know, pe people can do things in their lives and uh, make a difference. And that, that's what we're trying to do is, uh, is make a difference. Excellent. How do you get along? How do you get along with Hawass over there? Would you be able to do any digs if you needed to? Oh yeah. I can uh, just take a shovel and dig anything up you want. No, he's, he has his own, you know, agenda. He has his own story to tell. Uh, he has his own interpretation of the same direct physical evidence that all researchers have to interpret. But no, uh, you know, he's... Uh, Who is that? Who is it? Uh, the head of the archaeological... Yeah. Yeah, he was the head of the, uh, the ancient Egyptian stuff over there. But now he's got some other title. I'm not sure what it is. Most famous uh, Egyptian... Uh, living egyptian right now on uh, on the earth but uh no he's got he's uh you know the straight uh 
back muscle, heavy back muscle guy, you know. Uh, well, he's what? pushed the uh, a lot of countries to return artifacts. Uh, he has done that. That's a whole other issue. Uh, Egyptology is born out of tomb robbers. Early Egyptologists were just tomb robbers that they sold the booty to museums to display. And he has done that. And, and I am in favor of that. But uh, that is the mindset of, of Egyptology. Now, it, the whole system is much more genteel. You know, they, get, they pay money for a permit, and they're under the auspices of a museum, but the result is still the same. They take stuff from people's graves, put it in a museum, and regular people pay money to see it. Egyptology is the wealthiest science of all sciences on Earth, yet they are unable to engage in the scientific method by showing how a big heavy stone, a full-size stone, was drug up a ramp. And those casing stones I was talking about, those are precisely cut. And Egyptologists say that it was done using hand tools and the workers did it all day long. They made casing stones all day long, precision stone cutting, but Egyptology will not engage in the scientific method and make a casing stone uh, in the manner that all of their books say it was done. If Egyptology wants to shut up all of these fringe people, like myself, um, a whole bunch of other people, Christopher Dunn and all these other people with these ideas, Egyptology should engage in the scientific method, but they can't because their ideas are wrong. Well, too, uh, they know they can't do it. They know they can't do it. Yeah, they can't do it. It'd be like me studying uh, cows that jump over the moon. You know, you yeah. study how they land and how they jump over the moon and everything. And then some kid comes up and says, oh, can you show me a cow jumping over the moon? And then I would say, get out of here, kid. And that's mm. basically how sophisticated Egyptology is. They've come up with this story. You know, they, they were born from being tomb robbers. So everything they see is a tomb to rob. And, uh, you know, they said, oh, there's a great pyramid. People robbed the stuff out of it long before we could rob the stuff out of it. You know, that's the, that's the mindset of Egyptology. Well, we have this problem with a lot of uh, narratives that have been put on us over the years in a yes. lot of different areas. And then as people begin to unravel and say, wait a minute, I want to test this a little further or come up with a new hypothesis, they're immediately swooped down upon and attacked. Even if the idea is highly plausible, they're still attacked. Oh, well, that's, that's always true. Um, Nikola Tesla uh, brought his idea to his college professor about alternating current. And the professor said, oh, that's a continuous motion scheme. And um, Wagner, was it, who uh, developed a continental drift. He was a, uh, uh, he studied weather, but he come up with continental drift. And then the geologist says, oh, no, 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 no can't have that but then 40 years later they came up with plate tectonics you know what i'm trying to say so yeah there's, there's a, if you have a good idea science is going to try to destroy it so uh, <laughs> that's another an honest destruction process and then there's the bias the bias what do you call it the confirmation bias yeah. and all that yeah there is all all of that all of that you know uh science is certainly not unbiased because science is is just people it's humans yeah, yeah people so well, it's, we need it's to get fun. back to more of that we need to do get back to more objective uh study instead of a lot of the bias and opinion that seems to have crept into every aspect of, of life yeah yeah not not just uh like studying ancient man or or aliens but every aspect of our life and a lot of things have become tribalism especially politics but uh, there's politics in science and uh, preconceived money. <laughs> following the money done it, you know, all of that and all of those inhibit uh, progress in understanding in all fields. So it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's been an interesting ride this last 25 years, you know, instead of getting a motorcycle, you know, and killing myself the first 50 feet, you know, I've got this other hobby and uh it's it's been it's been a lot of fun traveled the world um met a lot of interesting people had some interesting conversations the most interesting are the people with closed minds because you can you can in your conversation dialogue if you will 
you can get them to where they will not admit a factual statement and that's that's really a, a fun to do if you will i do that a lot on facebook get in dialogues with people and uh socrates said through dialogue truth emerges so uh it, it's it's been fun and, it, and it's interesting mental exercise to do that but it keeps keeps a person sharp and challenges other people's ideas because so many people have uh, read a book and said oh i believe that author and then the, a, a new book comes out oh no i i already believe something else i'm not going to go with that but uh but we're yeah. new new people every day uh are uh, become fascinated with this direction of research well there was a time it seemed like in society that entertaining ideas and discussing ideas uh you could do that without you could have what, was, what i guess is called dispassionate discourse where you can separate kind of the emotion from the topic and say okay here's the topic uh, we've got a guy that it says uh, water he, was used with locks to climb up the side of the pyramid with these blocks. Okay, now disconnect all the emotion and let's just see what's going on here with this theory. That to me is a much more reasoned approach than just saying, oh, this guy's a bunch of hooey. I got my personal belief. This is what mm -hmm. it is. And that's what it's always going to be. That to me seems to be more prevalent than stepping back and saying, okay, wait a minute now. What do you got here? Yeah, true. people, uh, and I want people to, to do research. You know, the, the most controversial thing I can tell people to do is read a book and become familiar with everything. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, people are more interested in protecting their agenda or whatever as opposed to seeking truth. So that's, it's strange. That's, it's that's what science is all about protecting the agenda and what's in the history books and what's in the science books. A lot of the science out there is just a flaw a little bit. And we, it's up to us to figure out where's the flaws. And uh, I guess you've been researching this for 25 years. And what I see that you come up with is actually a workable explanation. A lot of the other th theories out there, yeah, they're good theories, but how do you work the theory? And that's where they come short. That's true. Uh, uh, in the construction of the Great Pyramid, a lot of the theories aren't accompanied with uh, valid demonstrations. Yep. Egyptology is the worst offender of that. But water locks, if you will, are demonstrated all over the world 24 hours a day. You know, the big ones, yep. little ones, and they work. They're effective, they're fast, they're powerful. So, uh, so that part, uh, I have a step above a lot of other theories in terms of a, of a uh, alien beacon or a, a weapon, you know, the, uh, the Giza Death Star, whatever. So, uh, but, uh, but I do appreciate being, being on shows like this that I can help get the word out and people can become familiar with the direction of the research that mm -hmm. we're conducting. Well, thank you so much because we, you know, our whole thing is about cutting edge conversations and exploring the quantum possibilities. So, you know, as always, you know, we encourage people to look at things with childlike curiosity, you know, and then approach it, you know, however you want to from there. But the childlike curiosity, I think, is such a such a lovely um, energy space for us to be in where we honor each other. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Oh, I appreciate this. This has been uh, a fun experience and uh, very, very glad that I was uh, got the opportunity to be on your show. Yeah, and I totally agree with the childlike curiosity because I remember when I was talking to a kid, very often their questions, they totally stumped me. So I got to go do more research. Awesome. Yeah. Tom, you want to take us out? All righty. Well, thank you again, Stephen. And folks can find your books. And uh, let me just put your books back up real quick. Um, they can find your books uh, and all your connections to all your different uh, social media, etc., on thepump.org. I want to thank you again, Stephen Myers, for being with us with a very fascinating and plausible theory about the lost technologies of the Great Pyramid and the, uh, the Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine. And we're probably going to do a... Uh, a little bit of a hook here because we really didn't get to that part of it as much 
So there's a hook for folks to do further research, get Stephen's books, take a look at what he's got to say. Highly plausible theory uh, about the uh, purposes of the pyramid and the engineering, uh, ancient engineering, I always find fascinating. So thank you again, Stephen. And with that, we're going to say goodbye. Thank you. So thank you again. Bye. <laughs> Bye now.